Thank you so much for having me here. This is amazing. Thank you so much for doing this for my second only historical happy hour. Cheers. Oh, <laughs> cheers. May this be the first of many, many, many. <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate it. And I'm so excited to geek out with you about historical fiction tonight. I can't even tell you. I'm a huge fan. And it's like, I mean, this is a dream come true to be able to do this webinar. So thank you. We have like, I think over 200 people registered and so far almost 100 on the call. So um, crazy. It's been great. Yes, I, this is so, I mean, that is what like the, the weird upsides of our strange, bizarro world we're living in is that suddenly, you know, book events are available to everyone everywhere. Yes. To the old days. Yeah. Where, you know, if you were in Albuquerque, you only saw people from Albuquerque. That's right. That's right. I know. I, I mean, normally with the book coming out, I'd be like driving around New England in the car to libraries and that's about it. Like I wouldn't be on a, any big book tour. So, so this is, this has been silver lining, right? You know, we got to look for the silver linings. Yes, exactly. And getting to hang out with other authors and talk history while not, you know, it ridiculously drunk at the historical novel society <laughs> conference. I know I, I am sad I we, I have family in San Antonio the historical novel society conference was supposed to be in San Antonio this year and now it's all virtual so that's kind of a bummer but next year for sure yes there, there will be another conference when the world goes back to normal and you know at least we have history to reassure us that there will be a normal again after all of this that's exactly right so I think it's seven and I'm going to jump right in with a little intro about you and okay. then I have a bunch of questions and I could probably go on for hours, but I have, I want, I want to leave some for the audience as well. So I'll give, I'll ask questions for about 20, 25 minutes, and then um, I will look through the questions in the audience and ask you some audience questions. Does that sound good? That sounds marvelous. Awesome. Awesome. So I think most of you know Lauren Willig, if you're a historical fiction fan, um, she is the New York Times and USA Today bestselling author of more than 20 works of historical fiction, including the Band of Sisters, which just came out, The Summer Country, The English Wife, the Rita award-winning Pink Carnation series, and three novels co-written with Beatrice Williams and Karen White, which I want to talk to you about too. Her books have been translated into over a dozen languages, awarded the Rita Booksellers Best, Golden Leaf Awards, and chosen for the American Library Association's annual, annual list of the best genre fiction. An alumna of Yale University, she has a graduate degree in history from Harvard and a JD from Harvard Law School. She lives in New York City with her husband, two young children, and vast quantities of coffee. I am also a huge coffee fan. So. Yeah, it's, you know, it's a fuel that keeps us going. That's exactly right, especially you have younger ones. I have a 14 and a 17 year old, but you have little ones, right? Oh, yeah, no, I have a three year old and a seven year old. They were two and six when we went into lockdown. So this has been, this year has been like a century. Oh my God, God love you. I know, we always say like, teens have been hard in different ways but like the you you have little kids I think that's the hardest group to like try to keep manage and like hide in your bathroom to do calls and things like that like that's yeah I give you, you know, I feel like at this point I'm just signing up to do more book events all the excuse <laughs> to lock the door of the bedroom and be like I'm doing my book talk <laughs> I need a oh. moment Right. That's, that's what I have to like. It's the funniest thing. They had to do dress up as someone for Thursday theme day for virtual school today in first grade. And my daughter dressed up as me on book tour. Oh, that I thought was hilarious. She got this on this cute little dress and somehow got her hands on a pair of my four inch heels. <laughs> that's amazing. I love that. It's just so cute. <laughs> That must have been a funny Zoom call too to see all the kids. <laughs> so great. Oh yeah, like the different people they dressed up as. It was pretty hilarious. That's awesome. So we're here to talk about your latest book, which just came out called Band of Sisters. And I loved it, loved it, loved it. And if you could just give me, you know, tell us about your inspiration for the story, why you decided to write it, and and the basic premise of the novel. That would be great to start okay. out. And I even for a change have a copy near me. I'm always so in awe of the authors who have those screens where like they have it like floating behind them or like it can be look you have a good bookcase there's girls. <laughs> we swapped it out this is my husband's office we just put it down here just <laughs> you know, I did it's funny I did there's an arrangement behind me of um band of sisters flanked by two sheep and <laughs> the, the bookseller the other day was like honey that's too far away people can't see it. I was like but it has sheep and he's like no but anyway so band of sisters which you can sort of see behind me flanked by sheep I do um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Yes, this book is, it's about a group of Smith College alumni um, who went off to France at the height of World War I to bring humanitarian aid to French villagers right behind the front lines. And, you know, these were, well, my women are fictionalized versions, but there were real women who did this, which I find so amazing and incredible because I had had no idea the Smith College Relief Unit existed. Oh. Which is like, you know, I've written, you know, I, I've written a bunch of books sort of around and in World War One, but mm -hmm. I just had never stumbled on them before. And so I did stumble on them while researching something entirely different. At first, I, I thought I had stumbled on someone's work of fiction. Um, because what happened was, well, you know, we mentioned the novels I co-write with Beatrice and Karen. Yes. We were researching a co-written book, um, which was set in World War One, World War II, and 1960s France. And for the World War I bit, we needed to know about Christmas customs in World War I Picardy, because this is the sort of stuff, you know, that drives historical novelists yes. mad, because there was a scene that was going to take place in Christmas of 1914, and they were in the occupied zone, and how would <laughs> Christmas have been celebrated in the occupied zone in World War I? Would they have traditional Picard Christmas cake? And this right, was right. driving us nuts, like the stupid <laughs> stuff that takes up way too much of your brain. Way too and much so there time. I was, you know, desperately Googling Picker Christmas Customs, World War I, and up popped this memoir by a Smith alumna talking about throwing Christmas parties for villagers in winter of 1917, right behind the front lines. And my first thought was, okay, A, this does not involve Christmas cake. And B, oh my God, what are these Smithies doing here dressing up as Father Christmas? And right. I have to know more. Yeah, that's just amazing. And I loved your, because I, you know, historical fiction nerd, I loved your historical notes at the end. And I was so amazed. Anyone who reads this book will be so amazed at how much of it is taken directly from the letters and the accounts of the Smith College Relief Fund unit that was there, right? Well, I, and I'm so grateful to these women for being inveterate letter writers. Thank yes. goodness for the golden age of letter writing, because it's the most hilarious thing. All of their letters end with stuff like, I really can't write. It's too cold. My ink freezes. I'm too exhausted at the end of the day. And then they go on and write another 50 pages worth of letters. <laughs> it's like, I really can't write, but let me tell you about this <laughs> other things that happened today. I'm like, yes, yes, please go on telling. Yes. But, you know, it's every historian's dream to stumble on that cache of papers where you find out all the stuff and all the detail that really happens. Um, you know, I, I've been thinking recently, it's funny, my very first book years and years ago was fueled partially because as a grad student in London, I didn't find a cache of papers and I was feeling annoyed about it. So I wrote a book where an imaginary grad student finds an imaginary cache of papers the way it should happen. And okay. with the Smithies, I finally feel like I found the historical sources I always dreamed of because here's, here's not one, but multiple women all writing home these insanely detailed letters about the same event. So you have comparatives. You can see the same event through different people's eyes and also see you know, how different people react to the same thing. How does that impact them with their characters? Yes, exactly. And that was amazing to me. I And I want to talk to you about like where you found this treasure trove. When I wrote The Beantown Girls, I was looking for source material. You always know like primary source material is so huge. And I found a treasure trove of letters and diaries at the Harvard Schlesinger Library. Um, it, they had a bunch of boxes. And so that was I, I was so worried I wasn't going to find anything like that. And it was like hitting the lottery. And so you found this at Smith, right? Did you find these yeah, letters yeah. at Smith? They had the The irony is, although it's so funny, I have such memories of being at the Schlesinger Library as a, a grad student. Oh. I could hear viscerally, you know, smell the library smell. <laughs> but, you know, the funny thing is, though, um, yes, there, I got these these amazing sources from Smith, but I never made it to Smith. So oh. what happened was when I, so I read this, the memoir I stumbled on and the story was incredible, but there were clearly, there were gaps. There was yeah. stuff missing. Like, and there was this line that really caught my attention where she talks about how the only hindrance to their high endeavor are the limits set by fellowship and their own personalities. <laughs> and I mean, I heard these like little bells went off in my oh. head, like ding, ding, ding. You know, so clearly good. something went wrong. You know, there's clearly some sort of infighting. Yeah. And I also, you know, so I managed to track down there was, there's really remarkably little written about these women. There's a line or two in a couple of books about Americans who went to France during World War One. There's a pamphlet published in the 60s in which excerpts of their letters are used to tell the story. And those letters, you know, that was my first exposure to the letters were amazing, but they were all very carefully excerpted. And they sort of caused yeah. 
more questions because among other things two weeks after they get to their headquarters their director and their director is this charismatic brilliant eccentric divisive character and this is her baby and she resigns out of the blue and there are a couple of comments after she resigns like oh it was for her health but mm -hmm. it's it's not convincing there's nothing mentioned about her so i had all these questions and i looked and i saw that there's amazing archive you know, at Smith, just of Smith College Relief Unit materials. Amazing. And, but at the time, my kids were, you know, one in five, and there was just no way I was up and going to Northampton for long enough <laughs> to look at this material. <laughs> I mean, like a week would have been stretching it, but it was very clear that there's way more than a week's worth of material there. And also, as you know, and anyone else who's worked in archives, until you get into the archive, it's not like you can say, well, I'd like this letter that will tell yes. me this thing. You don't know what's going to be in there until you no. get there. Actually, my exactly. favorite experience with this was when I was a grad student desperately searching for English Civil War sources in random records office across England. And I got to, it, it was somewhere in this, the Northwest of England. And I get to this records office. I'm like, you know, I want X, Y, and Z papers. And they're like, oh my gosh, you can read 17th century handwriting while you're reading them. Can you catalog them for us? Cause we can't read it and we don't know what's there. Amazing. <laughs> so you often know like, you know, what you, you know the names of the letter writers, but you know, it's, there's no way to indicate what's in them or if there's, they're gonna be what you need. But so I emailed the librarians at Smith Special Collections and said, you know, would it be possible to have some of this material digitized for me, these are the files I'm interested in. And I had no idea how much was in those files. And they were like, you realize that's a few thousand pages. I wow. Said, Are you okay? And they they digitized it all for me. It was amazing. Oh, bless librarians. They're the best. <laughs> they really are the best. I mean, I couldn't believe it. And they even, because they're librarians and amazing, they took pictures, you know, because they were doing the digitized copy so I was getting the letters with the handwriting oh god the handwriting and you know a sense of what the paper looked like and everything because it's you know basically photos of the real letters right. but you know to give me a real sense of what they looked like in the archive on the table they took some pictures of them for me just like camera pictures so I could see which was just so unbelievably lovely of them so great yeah oh that's amazing um so to dive into the story, I kept thinking that these women did this in 1917. Like I had to keep saying, I can't believe they did this. You know, a group of young single American women go overseas in 1917. Like it was hard enough for World War II. Like the fact that they made this choice. And so if you talk to me a little bit about like, you know, what you think they were thinking and were they naive going into this? Yeah, you know, this was one of the things that really fascinated me going in is sort of what makes someone decide to do something like this? You right. know, so many of the stories we read are of women, you know, on whom this is forced, you know, the woman in France where the Germans and, you know, the Nazis invade and suddenly she must make really hard decisions. But both, you know, your Beantown girls and my Smith College Relief Unit women, you know, they have to make the decision, the conscious decision yeah. to decide to go over there and do this. And I was like, what, what motivates people to do that? And so I found, you know, a whole range of motivations. You know, one woman genuinely, her, um, her boyfriend, she was trying to decide whether to get engaged to him or not at the time, but he had joined up and was going to be sent over and they were no longer allowing fiancés or wives to go over with them. So she figured just in case they did get engaged and she wanted to be there, she'd go over with the Smith unit. And while she was there, she could also buy her trousseau. So okay. she was one end of the spectrum. On the other end, you had, you know, people who had serious social service backgrounds who really felt like this was a calling. I think also like one thing we forget is how early Americans got involved in the war. That like from 1914 on, upper and upper middle class men were flocking to help the French. That, you know, there's this great story I found of with the day war was declared, a bunch of American guys rush to the American embassy in Paris and tell the ambassador, we want to join up and fight for the French. And he's like, um, guys, that's treason. You cannot <laughs> fight for a foreign power. And he finally, he was like, okay, you know, if you join the foreign legion, we'll kind of turn a blind eye because that's not exactly fighting for a foreign power. But, you know, but so you know, these Yale guys and Columbia guys and so on were running out there to work for the American field services, to drive ambulances, 
um, a, there's a group of Yale men who bought a plane and took, got a pilot to teach them how to use it so they could become the first Yale unit and fly for France. <laughs> and these are the boyfriends and cousins and ah. you know brothers of the Smith women. Like there are lots of bits in the letters where I'd stumble on things like, you know, while we were in San Nazar, Daisy bumped into her brother. And so they had already seen their, their brothers and boyfriends and whatnot going over. Mm -hmm. And you know, they wanted to be in on it too. There's a certain amount of that. And, but there's, you know, some of them went because friends were going. There was a lot of like, my best friend is going, so I will go too. Right, right. You know, yeah. So, yeah, but you know, the thing is, and it's very funny because they refer to themselves as college women, which I think gives everyone the impression that they were young, but they actually, they were a range of ages and sort of the average age was around 30. There were a lot of 30th birthday parties in the Psalm that year. So you know, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And the, you know, college women then didn't necessarily mean you were in college. It meant you had attended college. <laughs> right. And so that's how they think of themselves. But, you know, they're actually, a lot of them are not that young. And a lot of them had careers. You know, there's an archaeologist, there are two doctors, there are teachers and social workers, and so on. So these were independent women. Like, I was fascinated by the fact that they have a official agriculturalist who they really yes. need. One of the things they're trying to do is rebuild the agrarian base of the area. And so they need someone who understands cows and chickens because most of them catastrophically don't. And she gets delayed in Washington in both of the book and real life because right. she's working for the Department of Agriculture in DC. And here is a woman in her thirties, a Smith grad who's working for the Department of Agriculture. And yeah. I found that so fascinating because it blew away, you know, it surprised me less that there was a groundbreaking female archaeologist and two female doctors in the group because we know about those we know about you know female you know, groundbreaking female doctors but women who had other jobs and jobs in government kind of surprised yes. me and it made me rethink what i thought i knew about this era and women's roles in this era absolutely yeah I, when you mentioned the different careers that they had already had before they even went over I, that was so interesting to me because it was again 1917 like that's incredible and like like you said you hear about the kind of pioneering doctors and more you know certain people but yeah that was that was so interesting um i want to ask you about characters because i loved the characters in the story um you know the main characters emmy and kate and julia of course but also there were so many interesting supporting characters like Maude and Captain DeWitt. And so in terms of character development, like do you do a lot of character development before you dig into the writing or does it cut, do you just start writing and it evolves from there? Like how do, how's your character development process? I'm very character driven. So I do spend a lot of time thinking about my characters and talking aloud to myself and scribbling notes before I begin. But invariably, no matter how well I think I know my characters, they change on me as I'm writing them. It's like you're introduced to someone at a cocktail party and you get a superficial impression of them and you think you know them, but the more you talk to them and the drunker they get and the more they reveal, the more you realize your first impressions are flawed. <laughs> right. With <laughs> yeah. And you know, I found like I actually, my, my very dysfunctional writing process, the first three chapters take me forever because I'm still figuring out my main characters and their voices. And by the end of the book, I write really fast because I know who people are, but I found I can't rush that. I, I can only get to know my characters by writing them. And that yeah. sometimes takes forever. Yeah. Oh yeah. I feel that for sure. I can relate. I mean, um, I'm so envious of those authors who do like outlines and their characters do what they tell them and their characters are the way they think their characters are. Whereas I'm like, oh, right. Of course you did that. And like, right, right. They still surprised me towards the end of the book. I mean, there was one without spoilers, one yeah. of the two heroines, Emmy at the end of the book, you know, after they've gone through this very traumatic experience, I was trying to write this chapter in her viewpoint and I just I wouldn't click and I realized she was angry and once yeah. I realized that she was angry like everything made sense but anger wasn't an emotion I associated with her or expected from her but once I figured it out it made total sense that that was how she was feeling and it colored everything but you know she had to show me I couldn't figure it out yeah. on my own yeah and that that did make sense because it's like sometimes the people that they're Emmy has a very vivacious upbeat personality but there was this anger simmering beneath the surface that i thought yeah i totally got that after all you they've been an optimist too much and you know the rage of an optimist can yes. be terrible. yeah definitely um definitely so another question um 
you, t you know, I think one of the themes or one of the things that I was thinking about a lot when I was reading was the definition and meaning of charity and charity work and how it means different things to different people. And I thought that was such an interesting aspect of the story, particularly because the main character, Kate, had working class roots and her, her former Smith roommate, Emmy, came from this incredibly wealthy family and, you know, was was the whole sort of charity theme was that something you planned to weave through the story from the beginning like how what it meant and how how different people perceived it well this you know it's funny but this book i feel like so many things were handed to me on a platter and the charity theme was there it was baked into the story because one of the big debates in the smith college unit so sort of backing up for the people who haven't read it the smith college unit's plan was to sort of go into these devastated french villages that have been deliberately destroyed by the germans and then, you know, the villagers were sent back in to, you know, sicken and serve and all that. But the plan was to go in and rebuild them from the bottom up to sort of rebuild houses, you know, restore wells that had been poisoned, but also, and, you know, provide basic medical care, but also to rebuild cottage industry and agriculture and restart the um, industrial and agricultural life of the region, but in a very female centric kind of way. I mean, most of the men were gone, but, mm -hmm. and, you know, it's women helping women. But part of the plan it was to find ways to help the French villagers to be self-sufficient again. And their founder was really insistent on the fact that they didn't want to beggar anyone or make any, and you know, that they wanted people to, you know, not to feel like they were charity cases. And right. so that, you know, and that becomes part of the conflict between my two main characters, but it was already there because of course not all the women thought this was the most efficient way of doing this. That, you know, there were some who were like, you know, let's just give them stuff. And, you know, others who were like, no, no, we have to make them feel self-sufficient. One of their genius ideas that I just love for the trying to make people not feel beggared is that they run a traveling store where they deliberately charge below cost for items, but they do charge. And they, cause they figure, you know, the French will assume that Americans just can't figure out their money and they're putting oh, a fast on the Americans. And then they very proudly report home how much money they're losing on the store every quarter. And it's great and it really, it really works. But so, yeah, and I think, it, you know, I never really thought this through before, but this was also the great era of American charity in that, you know, we just had the Gilded Age where life was so brutal. And then you had that, the awakening of sort of, you know, Jacob Reese and how the other half lives and looking at the American slums. And you had upper middle class women like these Smithies going to urban slums to do social yeah. work. And so, I mean, this was, there was a huge ongoing debate about the best way to do this and how to help people without making them feel like you were being Lady Bountiful and they were, you know, rats in the gutter. So yeah. that all ties into it. And it was all sort of there in the zeitgeist and in the actual sort of foundation of the unit. Yeah, yeah. And to give people, you know, not make people feel ashamed for the help and get, instill, a, you know, make sure they don't lose their pride. Like you said, with the store, they, you know, at least they could purchase things. It wasn't all given to them. I, I love, yeah, so interesting. Well, and this uh, was one thing that sort of kept coming up again and again, because one of the things the Smithies did, I mean, again, basic social service work, they went from village to village, taking down everyone's stories. And one of the things that was most heartbreaking was people telling them of what they used to have. Like I had a house with a dining room with silk paper and this stuff may seem so trivial, but to them, of course, it was so, it loomed so large, these lost signs of status, you know, now all of these villagers, you know, the villagers who had once felt more important are now living in the mud with the rest of the villagers. Oh but yeah. They're just, you know, trying, holding on to these memories of what they used to have. Yeah, that those, that was heartbreaking, especially yeah, because some of them were more upper class and they had lost they had lost it all. Like you said, they were all down at the same level, and that was yeah, unbelievable. Uh, yeah, I just the historical details are so interesting. And you have a great um, before I ask another question, you have a great reader's guide on your website um, with pictures and great questions. So you, LaurenWillig.com, you should definitely all check that out because I love that. Um, so uh, relationships and friendships. Um, are another kind of theme of the story and how they evolve over time. That was another aspect I loved and how even though this group, this unit didn't, they didn't all get along perfectly. They didn't even necessarily like each other, but then by, by the time they had gone through everything together, there was a bond there, 
you know, it, what, and, and that bond was, you, it was clear that bond was going to be there for life. And so talk to me a little bit about like the interworkings and the friendships and the relationships and the story, because that was a really fun aspect of it. Well, thank you. Know, you. Quirky personalities and yeah, it was great. <laughs> Well, you know, I went to an all girls school for 13 years. So I sort of am very intimately familiar with the workings of female friendships. And also that weird thing you have where once you've either been through something with a group of people or you've known them forever, even if you don't particularly like them, even if you would never have chosen them under other circumstances, they are yours for life. They're like <laughs> that cousin who comes to Thanksgiving dinner and you roll your eyes, but they're still yours. And there's right, this right. weird fondness and you even kind of enjoy disliking them sometimes yeah exactly. And I really I found that in the real you know again every I really felt like with this book so much was just handed to me in ways I couldn't imagine I don't know if you felt that with Beantown Girls too yeah, definitely it, it just like you know for my main characters I really struggled over their personalities and their relationship because those I made that up out of whole cloth but with a lot of the side characters you know, the original unit had 18 members and I knew I could not juggle 18 characters, but I wanted to give a sense of you know, <laughs> the, the scope of the unit and what the characters were like. And so I think I wound up with like 15 named characters because that was as many as I could keep straight. I figured if I, you know, if I couldn't, other people couldn't either. But their personalities in a lot of cases were really directly drawn from the personalities as I perceived them in the letters. And there was this one woman I loved because she was so, well, I'm thinking of a good way to put this. Most of the women wrote these relentlessly perky letters home. Some of them wrote, one of them wrote relentlessly pissy letters home, but that's another story. But most of them are sort of like, la la la, everyone's great. We're all great. We're all having a good time. Let me tell this you this hilarious story of how we were almost stepped on by a cow. But anyway, you know, we were almost shelled by Germans. Ha ha ha. But there was one woman who wrote really honest letters back and she would go through and say things like, well, so-and-so's rooming with so-and-so, but they don't talk to so-and-so. And, -so. and nice. I kind of like so-and-so, but I don't know if she'll be friends with me. And she would go through in her letters home because she was very honest about, you know, she had not come with a friend and she was very miserably lonely. And so she wow. relentlessly explored the social dynamics of the rest of the women. And it was I mean, it was great. And I mined a lot of that for this book. But, you know, I'm so glad to see someone was thinking it because clearly this stuff was going on. But she was the only one who was really it was brutally straight out. I mean, others, you know, they hint at some of the stuff. And you're very aware that there are people who like some people and not other people. <laughs> right, um, right. The real women, for example, who were best friends at home who came over together. They decorate their, these, the women are living in these like really basic army barracks on the grounds of a, chat, of a ruined chateau. Um, and, you know, it's all very minimal and bare bones and they're roughing it. And these women decorate their barrack. Like they steal a roll of chicken wire that's meant for chicken coop to make a dressing table. You know, there's not <laughs> enough like fabric to clothe the villagers, but they're making curtains. And the yeah. others call them the cigarettes and <laughs> refer to their barrack as the honeymoon suite. I mean, oh, and there's like, there's, you know, it's cute, but there's also, I mean, there's an undertone of real annoyance there. Yeah, yeah it's like little passive aggressiveness there. That's so yeah. great. <laughs> I'm sure there was some stories too that you like wanted to include, but then the book would have been too long right it sounds like there was things you wanted to weave in and it's just like oh, tons of them and there was actually there was a side character I wanted to put in that I couldn't get in I wanted there was this bumbling English major I wanted to include and I just couldn't fit him in so yeah. I wound up having to write him off after a while but there's also like you know there's I'm um, you know, it's the act of condensing that you have to do to fit things in. There were so many more things that happened to them. And there's also just a lot of back and forth. Like they spend a lot of time going back and forth on buying trips to Paris oh, or yeah. to Amiens, which is nearest town. And crazy things sometimes happen to them. Well, you know, that stories I would love to include, like there's just, and they, they really... They had this amazing talent for recounting their adventures. They're like all raconteurs and they're like they can make, you know, a, a day stranded at a train station into a comedy routine. And there were some of those I so wanted to include, but it's just there would have been no point. They weren't f furthering the plot after a while. Right, right. You have to sort of pick and choose after a certain point. But there were times where I was really tempted to be like, forget the whole novel idea. I will just do an annotated version of these letters so we can include everything. Right, right. <laughs> and honor all of them and tell all the funny stories. I know. I, I love that. I, I read that in your notes. I'm like, that's that would have been a great idea. But the book is amazing. So you're good. Oh, thank you. 
Um, so a couple more questions, and then I'm going to take some questions from the audience. Um, you did this, you wrote this in dual narrative from, you know, Emmy's perspective and Kate's perspective. And um, I, I find that intimidating. And do you, do you, is that hard for you? Is that easier for you writing dual narrative? What? what you, know, it's, you know, it's very funny. I never really thought about this before, but I think it comes out of really having my start in romance because I always wrote in dual narrative. When I wrote my first book, The Secret History of the Pink Carnation, it was sort of a triple narrative because I had a modern frame character, but I was always writing in both hero and heroine's viewpoints and using that to get extra perspective but anyway, but yeah, so dual narrative, it just, you know, I love being able to contrast how different people are reacting and feeling about the same thing. I think it's also, it's funny, I grew up in the great era of head hopping, where, you know, it, uh, but, yeah. which was also the last great wave of World War II fiction, when you think about it, because I grew up in sort of Winds of War and Leon Uris and all of those yeah, books, yeah. Stephen Isaac shining through, although that's first person, so it doesn't count for the point I'm about to make. But a lot of the big epics I was reading back then, you're in everyone's head, and you're sort of seeing things from all these viewpoints at once. And then somewhere along the line, it became less conventional to be in multiple viewpoints and the viewpoints became divided by you know and the way i settled it with myself is if i'm in a chapter i am only in one person's viewpoint but i like to be able to see into other minds mm -hmm. and there, that's hence the back and forth but yeah i i've written one mono viewpoint book um that one's the other daughter which was set in 1920s london and i found it really it's funny because it should have been the simplest book i've ever written i kept you know i told myself it was going to be the simplest book i'd ever written and it was you know single timeline and mono viewpoint and it's one of the hardest things i've ever done wow interesting yeah and so do you find it's like almost like writing two books or is it or does it feel like the same book to you because someone i think mj rose said it was like writing two shorter books and then weaving them together when she wrote dual narratives so you know i have friends who do it that way i can't even when i'm writing dual timeline books i write them exactly in the order in which people read them so even in this case i mean we're in the same, you know, we're just moving through different characters, viewpoints, you're in the same scene in the same time period. But even when I'm writing a book that goes back and forth between, for example, you know, present day London and 1848, I, I still write them continuously. I don't go back and weave together. It just, that's somehow I tried it once because my good friend Beatrice Williams sometimes writes that way. And she's like, it's so much faster and easier. And I crashed and burned after two chapters and went back to doing it my usual way. I do whatever works. Exactly. Um, so I get this question a lot and I'm interested to hear what you have to say. Uh, do you have trouble letting go of your characters after your story is done? When, once you finish the story? You know, not generally, because I usually, I am always somewhere like midway through writing a book. I am usually, my attention is caught by the next bright and shiny idea. I mean, I'm like a magpie. I'm like, ooh, shiny. <laughs> and, you know, but and it's also, I found it's a truth universally acknowledged that whatever book I'm working on, I am convinced is dreadful. <laughs> while the book I haven't written yet is going to be the best thing ever and so much better than the horrible, crappy thing I'm working on. And so usually I am itching to start the next book and my head is already moving towards those characters. This book was a little bit of a strange experience for me because I wrote it partly during lockdown, during the pandemic, without childcare. And once you know the the first sort of panic of having to meet deadline was done, where sort of you know my husband was giving me two hours a day to work, and I was able to really knuckle down and focus. Sort of not having childcare began to take its toll, and I wasn't able to get right into the next book in the same way I usually would. So I've lived with these characters in their afterlife a lot longer because usually by now I would have finished writing the next book, and my head would have been mostly there even while I'm touring for this one. Right now, I'm still in the rewriting chapter 115 time stage of that book. And so, you know, I'm with these in a way I would no longer be. Interesting. Yeah. And the, is a part of it the fact that they are, you had such amazing source materials? I mean, you know, some of them are, are based almost directly on actual people. So I think that, you know, maybe that was part of it too, or I don't know. I, I just. Yeah, it is, it is, it's very hard to go from, you know, being handed such a comprehensive world to going back to triangulating between scant sources. And yeah. actually one of the things that drove me crazy with the book I'm working on right now, which is sort of a prequel to Band of Sisters. It's about the uh, the earlier life of the founder of the Smith College Relief Unit was that, you know, there are papers available about the real woman and they're at Smith, 
but the archives are closed because of the pandemic wow. and also because the library is being rebuilt. Oh, and wow. so I wasn't able, and fortunately that book is in, inspired by rather than, you know, this book was really, I needed the real material because this is about real events. This yeah. is inspired by sort of a gap in this woman's timeline that fascinated me. And oh, so okay. a lot of it is speculation. This is much more of a fictional character, fictional story anyway. So I don't really need her papers as much, but it's still annoying me to know that there's stuff I could have used <laughs> that's there and I can't get my hands on it. Oh yeah, yeah, I know that feeling, but okay, that's great because that was my last <laughs> question. What you're working on now before we take questions because there's tons of questions here in the chat and in the Q&A. So I'm going to... Okay, just go ahead. Um, oh, so Mindy Stone asks, I love all your books, both of you. Thank you, Mindy. My favorite question is always, what are you reading and loving right now? Well, this one is a hard one for me because my reading habits have gone all wonky thanks to the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because we got hit by the pandemic very early on in New York. We went into lockdown on March 11th. Like the door of our apartment did not open until early June. And, you know, there was a siren sounding outside our windows at all hours, which honestly, in a weird way, helped me write Band of Sisters, because oh, wow. I was really yeah. feeling what they were experiencing while I was writing this. There were a lot of weird parallels going on, but it made it very hard for me to concentrate on the sorts of books I would ordinarily love to read. Like people were sending me arcs I had been coveting and wanted. Like, um, actually, I had just seen Amy Popple right before things closed down, she'd given me an arc of musical chairs. And I love oh. these books like crazy. They're contemporary social satire. They're hilarious. They're really brilliant. fun, hilarious. Yes, I opened it and could not read it, even though I had been yearning for this book for a year. <laughs> um, what wound up getting me through was reading mid-century British and American mysteries. I think uh, like I bring lots of Mary Roberts Reinhardt. She's considered the American Agatha Christie. And I read through, I had never heard of her until a friend recommended her. This woman, Patricia Wentworth, who wrote a really long series about a detective named Miss Silver in sort of interwar England. You know, oh, wow, like, okay. Spinster, who has become a private inquiry agent. And they're kind of like the poor man's Agatha Christie. And you know, Miss Silver is entirely omniscient and she always finishes knitting the baby's booties and you know, solves the crime. And they're just so comforting. Because yeah. I knew at the end of every single one, you know, Miss Silver was going to solve the case. And, you know, I've been branching out a little. I've now been reading, uh, I read Louise Miller's book, City Baker's Guide to Country Living, and oh, people, which are yeah. so good. So and lovely. Trisha Ashley's British Chicklet, which I've always loved. But I found that, like, basically, I can read Chicklet set in either small English or American villages, where you know everything will turn out well in this enclosed <laughs> community. Or I can read mid-century mysteries where someone will solve the crime and restore the world to rights. And I haven't really, like, I had this brief moment where I could read historical fiction again. I think it was this summer when things were starting to open up a little in New York. And in this mad rush of optimism, I read Sue Meissner's Nature of Fragile Things and oh. Marie Bedick's Mystery of Mrs. Christie and a couple of other books. It was great. And then things started to get grim again. I was back to Miss Silver. <laughs> right, right. Comfort reading. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've actually, I just because my 14 year old is a huge reader. So I read The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue by oh, V.E. About that. that was such an, it's such a unique book. It was really interesting. And I love to read stuff with her. And then this is, a we've been listening to like memoirs on audiobooks. So we're, we were, we've been listening to Colin Jost's A Very Punchable Face, which, <laughs> <laughs> which is an excellent title. Excellent title and really funny. And like you said, just kind of light and, you know, escapist, you know, just, yeah, very light. So those are two that I've re recently gone through um, within our mini book club of two. So <laughs> Um, well, it's funny because I found that for a while it felt like fiction was sort of across the board getting darker. Like there was less funny, there was less light. And then this came out of the blue at us. And all of a sudden, all of us are craving things that are they're funny or reassuring or, you know. Hopeful, no, we, we yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So is there, Jean Deary asks, is there a chance you will write a second book with the abundance of information that you have? Well, I'm actually, so as I mentioned, I'm sort of going backwards in time because I was really fascinated by the real founder of the Smith College Relief Unit, who I sort of lightly fictionalized in Band of Sisters. I, you know, the real woman was named Harriet Boyd Hawes. My fictional version is Betsy Hayes Rutherford, but both are, you know, graduated from Smith in the 1890s. And the, the real woman, and I borrowed all this from my character, 
went off to Athens to study at the American School of Classical Studies because she was determined to be an archaeologist. And they looked at her and said, ladies don't dig. And she <laughs> said, mm, but I'm here to dig. And they were like, have you considered being a classics librarian? And she was like, no. And you know, also scandalized Athens by biking around in bloomers. I mean, real character. Okay. Um, Yes, with, of course, you know, a private income, which allowed her to be a real character. But while she was there, the Greco-Turkish War broke out. And she wound up, although she failed her Red Cross nursing class, pulled strings among her friends of the Greek aristocracy and got herself sent to the, sent to the front, where it proved, wow. she proved that she had a genius for organization, despite her lack of actual nursing skill, and was decorated by the Queen of Greece. But then this is where the gap happened that fascinated me. Instead of resuming her classical studies, she goes back to the States and winds up joining Clara Barton's Red Cross and nursing in the Spanish-American War, and then goes back to Greece and digs up Crete and becomes this famous archaeologist and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, where did the Spanish-American War come into this? Why did she go there? And so while I was writing Band of Sisters, this was sort of at the back of my head and my my imaginary version of this woman started dropping hints to me. The you know, way a character pokes you and is like, yeah. Look at me, I've got this to tell you. And so <laughs> I started to I, you know, have an idea of what happened to her during the Greco-Turkish War that made her run off to Cuba to redeem herself. And so that's the book, you know, I work down right now. But so it comes out of those sources, but in a really yeah. sideways, backwards way. Yeah, it's kind of a spinoff of that. Yeah, interesting. It's a prequel. Like a friend of mine was like, yeah, only you would go back in time with this. You know, I have toyed with the idea of, you know, I generally avoid World War II, but I've toyed with the idea of writing a sequel. There's this about, there's this little French orphan who the unit basically adopts. Mm -hmm. And I thought about writing a book about her in World War II, because, you know, what happens if you are, you know, a French woman, but who's been raised in America by your American adoptive parents? What happens when France is invaded and occupied again? How do you react to, you know, where do your loyalties lie now? What do you feel you have to do? So that's yeah. sort of vaguely on my radar for, you know, if I ever, ever, ever get my Spanish American War book done. <laughs> I'm sure you will. <laughs> um, this is a good question from Lisa Balu. Can source material feel restrictive when you come up with the story arc and write scenes? Like, did you feel confined at all? Well, you know, it's, this is a game I've always loved playing with can you work within the constraints? Because sometimes it's actually really fun when you've planned one thing and then the historical narrative bends another way and you're like, okay, can I fit my people around this? And often you'll find it works better that way. I really generally do not believe in moving historical events or real things around to suit me. And in this case, like I had their, their narrative was so laid out and worked so well. There were a couple of things, you know, I changed or played with and but like mostly small stuff. Like in real life, the group drives down to their headquarters in two groups and I have them drive down in one group, you know, it's stuff like that. Yeah, where, yeah. Yeah. You know, oh. I found generally, and this dates like way back to my other books, I really like trying to make my characters fit the events rather than the events fit my narrative. Same. I totally agree. Um, oh, and the regarding World War II, someone at Valerie Souders asked, did the Smith College Relief Unit assist during World War II or any other wars? Or was this just a one-time group? You know, I honestly don't know because I didn't look into that. I can tell you that, you know, and this is not a spoiler, so this is all in the historical record. The Smith College Relief Unit does go back to their, their headquarters at Gray Court after the war and they comprehensively complete their rebuilding and reconstruction plan. And there is a Smithy at Gray Court until 1922 when they wow. finally hand over the last keys to the French and depart. Um, they, they also inspire a Vassar College Relief Unit and a Wellesley College Relief Unit oh, wow. to follow them out to France you know, you know, a few months after they go out. But you know, as for World War II, that was something I just didn't really look into at all. Yeah, no, oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Very cool. It's cool that the other sister schools did that as well, like trying to compete maybe a little bit with, <laughs> with the Smith unit. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting, sort of, you know, and I'm actually, I'm doing a talk to the um, Vassar Club of the Hudson Valley in a couple of weeks. And I, before I do that, I really want to go digging into what the Vassar unit actually did, because I found that different units had different experiences. And then even with the Smith unit, I've just had this wonderful email back and forth with a lovely woman whose husband's aunt was part of the second wave of Smith unit volunteers oh, wow. who had a completely different experience from the first wave because the first wave is the women who sign up, you know, the women I write about, the ones who sign up in um, April 1917 
and are there through the German invasion of March 1918, you know, they're really there in the villages doing this reconstruction plan. The women who join up as part of the second group of volunteers can't get out to their headquarters initially because, well, the Germans are invading, so, you know, they can't really. And then they wind up doing other stuff that's not at all like the work the initial group are doing. They do canteen work, they do nursing. Um, you know, this woman whose husband's aunt was there told me her aunt, his aunt worked in a face hospital, um, which I'm assuming is reconstructive surgeries, I oh. can imagine. Oh. And so their experience was so different from that of the original group. And so the little I've seen about the Wellesley and the Vassar unit, because if there was not much in the Smith unit out there, there's even less about the Wellesley and Vassar units publicly available. The little I've seen suggests that they had a sort of more wartime experience before moving on to reconstructive work. Interesting. Yeah. yeah, no, 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 really interesting. Um, Sharon Person writes, do you think you will always write historical fiction from now on? I honestly don't know because you know, I, I'm an omni reader. They say a good, there has to be a word for it. <laughs> a biblio omnivore, but omnio biblivore. Anyway, but yeah, I read everything except science fiction, and sometimes I'll even read some of that. And so, at various points in my life, even though historical fiction is you know my my true love and whatnot, I have flirted with writing chiclet and romance and mystery and fantasy and other genres. And so, I really can't say you know whether you know someday that book will just happen. I have a rom-com that's been sitting on my hard drive now since 2011 under the title Random Contemporary Romance um, that I hope I'll finish someday. So I just, oh, cool. yeah, and I've always wanted to write a mystery novel. There's one called Death by Shakespeare, where someone gets crushed by a bust of Shakespeare in the Garden of the Elizabethan Club at Yale. That I've been <laughs> planning to write since I was a senior. Oh, I love that. You, these <laughs> days. you never know. <laughs> right, right. Uh, someone asked about the Vassar College um, visit. I, she said, I'm, I'm I live in Poughkeepsie, Antonio Amaro. Will you announce more about this visit? Is it a virtual visit? This is a virtual visit with the um, Vassar Club of Hudson Valley. So I don't oh, okay. know, you know if it will be made publicly available or you know what the plan is for that. Okay, very good. Um, Oh, I one question I want to ask: When you write with Beatrice Williams and Karen White, how many books have you read? Three books with them now. Yes, yes. and we're we're working on number four right now. So, how does that work? Like, and like, do you all? I mean, I am just I'm in awe of that too because I don't know how how do you even do that? Honestly, if I weren't doing it, I couldn't have imagined it either because the <laughs> idea of like sharing your world and your characters and your voice, it's like who would do a crazy thing like that. Um, but we stumbled into it. It was really because we wanted our publisher to pay our bar bill, and that was a great motivator. Oh, and we fun. literally stumbled into this process that's worked for us, where we get together and we plot out the whole book together, which is not something any of us do for our individual books. Oh, really? And Oh, oh wow. yeah, no, not at all. It's really funny because when we wrote our first book together, The Forgotten Room, so we we met up for tea and scones and wound up outlining the whole book. And then we went back to our respective homes in different states. And because it's so we all wrote multi-timeline books. And so we were like, fine, we all write dual timeline books. Let's write a tri-timeline book where all three stories are interwoven into one novel. And you know, we'll just, you know, we'll each take a character. So we plot it together and then we each claim a character. And then we write round robin because the books are sort of in the way of multi-timeline books. You get, you know, timeline A, timeline B, timeline C, right. A, B, C, and so on. And so we we email around our chapters to each other. And before reading, before writing your own, you always read the other two. So you sort of get their voices and whatever they're doing in their chapters in your head. And okay. it all mixes and mingles. And that's how it works. And somehow this worked for us that first time. And so we've just, and then we get together again to um, edit the book. And so that's that's how we do it. And it just, again, we stumbled on this entirely by accident. And we had no idea this would work. And we're yeah. so thrilled and delighted that it did. So what's the fourth one that you're working on now about? So this one is set in Newport and the Gilded Age, the 1950s and the present day. It all started oh, as a oh. mansion makeover show. And we were <laughs> like, what would happen if someone took a Newport mansion and did some sort of horrible mansion makeover show? And then we were like, ooh, book idea. So yeah, that's, that's what we're working on now. So the present day story because we like to have sort of a bit of levity and it's usually the most modern of our storylines provides the levity 
Yeah. And yeah. in this case, celebrity is provided by this sort of Robin Leach lifestyles of the rich and famous slash Mac mansion makeover show in this poor Newport mansion. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, I love that premise. That sounds so, now when's that coming out? So that one's going to come out in autumn of 2022. Okay, so we uh, readers have some time. <laughs> so yeah, that's, yeah. time. We're about yeah, we're about I think um, seventy thousand words in at this point, so oh, we still have about half the book left to go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, this has been delightful, and I want to thank you so much for being my sec very my second guest on Historical Happy Hour. I am so deeply honored. Thank oh, you. So, so great. Much, so much fun. We've had so many, we have, you know, tons of people on and everyone stayed on and has so many kind things to say. I'll send you the recording about your books and, and there's, there's tons of fans here. And so t for those of you, uh, for those in the audience who are just getting to know you, or don't know you as well, how do they stay in touch and okay. where can they order Band of Sisters and all of that good stuff? Okay, well, you can find me on my website, www.laurenwillig.com. Um, as Jane mentioned, there's a reader's guide to Band of Sisters there where I love the real material so much, I couldn't resist trying to shoehorn in as much as possible. So you can find maps and pictures and all so that. Good. Yeah, yeah, so, so good. Like historical geek heaven. Um, <laughs> But yes, and I also I spend way too much time on my Facebook author page, which is just Facebook slash Lauren Willig. And on Instagram, where you can see pictures of the muffins my kids make me bake for them, and also book stuff, which is just at Lauren Willig. I'm very simple. Everything is sort of Lauren Willig. Um, I'm also on Twitter, but I haven't figured out how to use it. So I pop in there like once every two months, sort of push the, tentatively push like buttons and retweet things and hope I'm sending them the right places. So do not look for me on Twitter because, you know, it's, I don't really do anything on there, but I'm on Instagram and Facebook a lot. So come find me there. And as for buying the book, it's available all sorts of places. Um, you know, nag your local bookseller, but, um, and if you want signed copies, I am actually signing real physical books for a Shakespeare and company in New York. They're right near my son's preschool. So whenever they get a personalization order, they just call me and they're like, so can you stop by on your way to pick up today? And I run in and I write two. Oh, summers. perfect. That's so great. They personalized book. They make great presents, great Mother's Day gifts. Great Mother's Day. Lexington <laughs> Avenue. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, this is a perfect Mother's Day book. I love it. Yeah, for that. That's a great idea. Everybody yeah. should buy it for their moms or daughters. So. <laughs> Yes, so, and I am very much looking forward to Secret Stealers, which if anyone here doesn't know is a Kindle first reads right now. So go download that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the shout out. And thank you again for coming. And um, and I will see you all over social media. And hopefully someday we'll meet in person after all this pandemic stuff is yes, over. Yes, not in San Antonio, but at another yeah. historical novel society conference. Yeah, fingers crossed. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you, Lauren. Take care. You too. Bye.